king me. These are two words that you say in checkers when an ordinary piece reaches the other end of the board and then all of a sudden it becomes something more than just an ordinary piece. It becomes something extraordinary. It becomes something great. It becomes something that it wasn't originally meant to be. You see, in checkers, the king is the, the piece that has the ability to move in places where all the other normal pieces don't. It has the power on the board. It, it, in essence, it has control. Now, I've got to be honest. I haven't played checkers in like uh, 20 years or something. I, think I, can't, it was, I think the last time we had like a seventh grade checkers competition or something. I don't remember exactly the specifics, but it's been a long time. But even though it's been a long time, I can distinctly remember the feeling within me when I could look my opponent in the, in, in the face in the middle of, of the, the match and say, king me. And there's like a, like a sense of power like you get from that. You kind of, by the looks of it, you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. I have a feeling you're like, we don't know, nerd, we don't know what you're talking about. Okay, maybe you just need to say it. So what we'll do is we'll, I'll count to three, you just say the two words with me, okay? We'll say king me at the same time. Ready? One, two, three. Three, king me. You feel that? <laughs> you feel that power surging through your body, right? It feels good. And maybe the reason we in, enjoy saying those two words is because deep down, we love the idea of taking control. We love the concept of, of power. We love the idea of being able to assume a position of authority that isn't rightfully ours we like the idea of transforming from something normal into something great. Deep down, that's what we all want, isn't it? We all want to be king. It's part of our nature. Now, I know this is, I don't like to claim this, but technically, I guess I could be considered a millennial, depending on which spectrum you choose. I'm on the, on the old end, no matter which chart or graph or whatever they use to determine that. But I, I w maybe would be considered a, a millennial by most uh, people and and so I can speak from from experience with this group, especially people in my generation. We we love to resist authority, don't we? One of the common quotes is "Question everything." We're a generation who who doesn't want to submit to anybody because we want to be in control in our own life. The millennial mantra is "King me." That's the mindset. That's the attitude. So deep down, we don't want to submit. We want to be king. And this morning, as we enter into the pages of Scripture, we're going to find a character who embodies this whole mentality, this king me mentality. We're going to look at a, a character in Scripture who's named Adonijah. Now, he's one of the sons of David, but he's very similar to the son we heard about last week, Absalom. But there's some things that are different. So that's where we're going to be this morning. He epitomizes the king me attitude. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. Now you might be confused because we've been going through 1 and 2 Samuel. It's right after 2 Samuel. 1 Kings chapter 1. And for those of you who've been with us, you know we're going through this series on the life of David, which is called After God's Own Heart. Stories from the life of David. And so far, we've covered the whole first and second book of Samuel. This is the main book that describes the life of David. And last week, we talked about this character, Absalom, and we ended our section in uh, ninth, the 19th chapter of 2 Samuel. And if you notice, if you were turning the pages, there are more chapters after chapter 19. And so it's not that I'm just skipping part of David's life. It's just that those final chapters, they really operate more like the appendices to the book. And so basically there are various sections of the, the story that can be inserted in other places. They're not necessarily in chronological order. And so Lord willing, next week I'll come back to some of that as we wrap up the series. Next week is the very last week through the life of David. But today we're picking up the story now. In 1 Kings chapter 1. So if you're there, uh, that's where we're going to be. 1 Kings chapter 1. We're going to see the life of Adonijah. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Just like last week, I'm going to do sections to our story. Five different sections. And so the first section we're going to jump into right here is the scenario. I want to paint this picture for you of what's happening at this point in the story. And the way I'm going to do that is by reading the first four verses of 1 Kings chapter 1. 
And notice how it says. Now King David was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servant said to him, Let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms, that my lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel, and found Abishag, the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was in service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. Now this is a very strange scenario, I will admit. Very strange stuff going on here. Our story opens up with David as an old man in this story. Now, uh, most scholars would say around this time he was probably about 70 years old. Now, I know in our culture, 70 is, is pretty old, right? Uh, Greg Deason, you should know, right? You're around 70? No? Oh, no. 60, sorry. <laughs> he's a safe bet, okay? He's, he's on the staff team, and the next oldest staff is me, so I had to go with Greg. No, at this, at, in our culture, 70 is pretty old, which, by the way, he's got a ways till he's 70. I just, I'm messing with him. Uh, 70 is, is pretty old, but in that culture, 70 would have been really old. Because the average lifespan, according to most scholars I read, was probably around 35. So to be 70, this, this guy David was ancient. He was old at this point. And, and the reason we specifically read about the fact that he is old and advanced in years is because the author in this beginning section, he's trying to paint this picture and set up this scenario where we're realizing that David is frail. He's old and he is frail at this point in his life. I mean, picture this for a moment. We know of David the warrior, right? I mean, just imagine the stories we've talked about. David, this, this, this strong warrior of a guy who defeated the giant Goliath, who ended up fighting a bear and a lion with his bare hands. Now, this is the guy who fought against the enemies of, of God, the Philistines. This is the one who, when he's listed with all the mighty men, it says he's the mightiest. David was the warrior who, who they sang songs about. Saul has slain his thousands, David his tens of thousands. So this is a man's... Man, he is strong, he is courageous, and now at this point in his life, he can't even stay warm with blankets. Uh, we see this picture of frailty in David's life, and it's just a reminder for us that life is fleeting, isn't it? The youthful vigor and energy that we have, it's not going to be something that will last forever. That stuff will fade, so we need to make the most of the time that we have. And so in order to keep warm at night, notice the plan for David. The servants said to him, let a, a young woman be sought for my lord the king and let her wait on the king and be in his service and let her lie in your arms that my lord the king may be warm. So this is the plan to keep David warm. Now I, I'm certain as I read through this passage, David was cold and he needed to be warmed up. The, the text says it. But I'll be straight up with you. Let's not sugarcoat this. Something sketchy is happening in this passage. This is weird. It was a weird scenario. There's more to, to the story than what we just read by just going through this. You see, in, in the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, there was this mindset, this superstition, that when someone would get old and advanced in years, and a man would be older, that one of the ways that he would regain his youthfulness and his vigor and his vitality would be to be intimate with a younger woman. This is a, a warped, twisted, weird thought that they had, but this is what they believed. And so this is why they found this woman, Abishag, for David. So let's be real, right? It wasn't just, the woman wasn't just to keep him warm, okay? There's more going. I mean, if you're cold, do what everybody else does and fill a, a, a sock with rice and put it in the microwave, David. Like, it's not that hard, not that complicated. You got a lot of money, buy an electric blanket, whatever you got to do. You don't need a lady to be shacking up next to you at night. You don't need that. There's more happening here. That's why I think, and in fact, it's, this is, I don't know, uh, it could be bad to say this, but you even see it when it talks about a beautiful woman. Why does she have to be beautiful, right? I mean, 98.6, whether she's beautiful or not, I mean, it's the same thing. Just gets any old lady in there to hang out with David so she can keep him warm. But obviously, there's something here. They look for a beautiful woman, and they bring her in. She's a young, beautiful woman, and she's there with David, and she's keeping him warm. But notice what the text says at the very end. It says, but the king knew her not. Now this is very polite Old Testament language to try to just say that David was impotent. 
This, this is what the, the, the narrative is describing for us. The king knew her not. He, he was advanced in years. He had lost his strength, and he was impotent. And so in that culture, that was a way of saying he's really weak. They, they viewed impotence as a sign of, of strength. And so David is this older, weak king nearing the end of his life, and this is the scenario for us. This is the, the setting of our story. And so that's number one, the scenario. Secondly, we're going to move into now the plot is going to thicken. We're going to go to the subversion. That's a big word for mutiny or insurrection. The subversion. Notice what it says in verse 5. Now, Adonijah, this happens to be David's son. It says, the son of Haggith, who is one of David's multiple wives. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. So notice in our passage, David's old, he's weak, but he ain't dead. I mean, he's still on the throne. Nevertheless, one of his sons, Adonijah, he sees the weakness of his uh, elderly father, and he tries to capitalize on that and take advantage of the situation. He tries to take control of the throne by his own efforts and his own, on his own terms, and prematurely, before David is even dead, he tries to exalt himself and essentially just say, king me. Now, this is the mindset. King me. I, I want to be king. That's basically what he says. He, he literally says, I will be king in verse 5. Now, what's interesting about this is you might say, well, maybe he can make a legitimate claim for that. He is a son of the king. In fact, if you do your homework a little bit, you'll know that the firstborn son of David, Amnon, remember he was killed last week. We talked about that by Absalom, the thirdborn son. There's a secondborn son somewhere in there. His name is Chiliab, but we don't hear about him after his birth, so it's very possible that he's already died, especially if David is so old. And so... Uh, this guy over here, Adonijah, he's the fourth-born son, so maybe he's the oldest. The problem with that mentality is there's nothing about Israel's uh, kingly succession that would lead you to believe that it's any kind of linear, basic standard, right? We have Saul, who the people wanted to kind of pick him, but God was the one that chose him. Then a completely different family, you've got David. He's the seventh-born son from a completely different family. The, 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 his father was Jesse, not Saul, and God chose him to be king. And so the basic premise we get so far in our narrative is that the king is chosen by God. That's the basic idea. God is the one who chooses the king. He is the one who determines. So that's the succession plan. Whatever God wants to do, that's what we do. But you see, Adonijah doesn't care about that. He doesn't want to care at all or listened about what, what God thinks or God's opinion, God's authority in that matter. He obviously doesn't care about the authority of his father because before his dad's even dead, he's saying, I will be king and trying to proclaim his greatness. No, Adonijah cares about one thing and one thing only, exalting himself. King me. That's his attitude. That's his mindset. Doesn't want to submit to anybody. He doesn't want to submit to authority. He wants to be the authority. And so we read in this narrative that he begins to amass some people to help him out with becoming king. The first person he convinces to come alongside him is Joab. That's David's longtime commander. And, and we read in the narrative, in fact, even last week we covered some of that a little bit when Joab ended up going around David's back and killing his own son. There begins to be this disconnect between David and Joab. And so we see Adonijah, he capitalizes on that. He takes Joab by his side. He even takes Abiathar, the priest, David's priest, by his side, and he begins gaining momentum to try to subvert the crown. And so that's what he's doing. He's trying to gain this uprising. In fact, he even throws a coronation feast for himself. He has this crazy idea that if he can say, I want to be king and then have a feast, that people will start believing he's actually king. And so he throws a big dinner, and notice what it says in verse 10. It says, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet or Benaiah or the mighty man or Solomon his brother. So notice how he has a coronation feast but some of the people who should be there aren't there. Why? You ever do something wrong and you know it's not a good situation and you maybe have some people around you, you that are kind of okay with doing wrong things and you're fine talking with them, but there's some people you know that, 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 that are probably going to do the right thing so you just kind of keep quiet around them, right? Oh, if grandma found out I did this, she'd really say something, right? So that's kind of the, the, the mindset here. He has a, 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 a meal, but anybody who's going to call him out, right? Nathan has no problem calling people out. He did it to David. Benaiah and the mighty man, they're beasts, right? They're going to beat him up, so he doesn't tell them. And Solomon, 
well, he has legitimate opportunity to, 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 to take the throne himself. And so these are all threats to his kingship. So he does not invite them. He chooses in, instead to, to bring other people, and he continues his plan of subversion, which leads us to the next point. Number three, the strategy. Strategy. Now, in the next several verses, verses 11 through 27, which I won't read, we discover there's a plan. See, Adonijah, he's trying to steal the crown, and so there needs to be a plan to stop him. And the people who orchestrate this plan, they're the people who will be most affected if Adonijah becomes king. Think about it. Bathsheba was Solomon's mother. And if Adonijah becomes king and he's fighting for power, he's going to wipe out Solomon and his mom. They're a threat. And so we read in this narrative that some people come together and they begin a strategy to stop Adonijah. And ironically, two different people work together on this plan who you might not expect. Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba, the wife of David. Now, as this narrative continues, they basically, they have this plan where they're going to come up to David and they're going to encourage David to make a public declaration of his intent to choose Solomon as king. And so that's what they begin to do. They begin to talk to him. And for the sake of time, you can just read that, verses 11 through 27. It's, it's uh, pretty much what I'm telling you, but if you want to read it, go ahead. You can do that for yourself. But I do want to highlight one principle, because for me, it's interesting that these are the people who are working together. When was the last time in our story that Nathan the prophet was dealing with David and Bathsheba? Chapter 12 of 2 Samuel, when David ended up sinning and committing adultery with Bathsheba and, they, and, and murder. And in that moment, Nathan was the guy who said, bro, this is wrong. This is sin. God has sent me to tell you, you're wrong. Nathan came to call him out. And so Nathan, he dealt with these two in the midst of the thick of their sin. This is how uh, that relationship began. And now notice here how in 1 Kings chapter 1, after, after the story continues, now these three are working together for good and sovereign purposes. Notice that. Now I think it's kind of interesting that these people are together, and it's just a, a reminder for us of the incredible power of God's grace. Incredible power of God's grace. Remember, Nathan called them out, but after he confronted them, what did David do? God's hand was heavy on him. He felt the guilt of his sin, so he confessed his sin. And God's hand was relinquished off of David. He repented of his sin. God restored him. In fact, it said that God put away his sin. And so after David con confessed and repented, God now brought these people together for his good purposes. And it's a reminder for us that God often operates with us with extreme grace. So let me just say this morning, if you're the person in the room who's thinking, you know what, I hope Pastor Joe never figures out my past. I hope he never realizes how bad I've actually been in the past because if he did, he would have nothing to do with me. Or if you're the kind of person in the room who goes, you know what, I hope that this church never realizes how terrible I used to be because if they did that, they would never want any part in, us, in, in me. They would never want anything to do with me because that's not something they'd be interested in if they found out the truth. Beloved, don't believe that. God's grace is greater than our sin. God's grace is greater than your sin. So if you have a checkered past and you're feeling guilty about it, I want to encourage you this morning, if you've trusted in Christ, if you've confessed your sin, if you're repenting of your sin, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past, God can still use you. The church can still use you. God loves to use broken people. God loves to use broken people. Don't ever think with that mindset that you've done far too much, that, that, that grace can't take care of you. Grace covers a multitude of sins. And God loves to use broken people. He can use you in incredible ways. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God's grace is greater than your sin. And just to remind you about some broken people that God used, Jacob was a deceiver. But God used him to establish a, a great nation. Moses was a murderer. But God used him to deliver his people out of bondage. Elijah had a bad attitude. But God used him to defeat the prophets of Baal. Peter was impulsive. But God used him to build his church 
Paul was an enemy of Christ, but God used him to advance the gospel to all nations. God loves to use broken people, and if you're a broken person, rest assured, God can use you. God loves to use those who are broken. And so no matter what you've done, I just want to encourage you this morning to to recognize God can use you. Because in our story, we have two very broken people, David and Bathsheba. They messed up. And the very dude who came to them and said, hey, you done messed up, right? You you, you screwed up. God is going to bring judgment upon you. This very guy who did that to them is now working together with them later on in the story for good, sovereign, godly purposes. And so the, the moral of the story is God can use you. He can use you. Which leads to our next point, the succession. The succession. As our story continues, uh, these two, Nathan and Bathsheba, they give their strategy and make their plan to David, and David agrees that they should, in fact, thwart the plan of Adonijah and instead crown Solomon king. And so notice what it says in verses 32 through 35. It says, King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. And they came before the king, and the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your lord, and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. You shall then come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne and he shall be king for he shall be king in my place and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. So David makes that proclamation. We see that in the next verses Zadok, Nathan, Benaiah, they listen to the king. They do exactly what he says. Solomon is taken down. He's anointed as king. The people begin to celebrate and say long live King Solomon and notice After they say this, the party that starts in verse 40. It says this, And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth was split by their noise. I recognize we have kind of a loud worship team sometimes, right? And I've heard people say, hey, the worship team is pretty loud, right? But I mean, this is louder. The earth is split by their noise. This was a party. This was a celebration. They were rejoicing and celebrating, and it was very, very loud, And so the people are so loud that it just so happens Adonijah is sitting down at his coronation feast with the other guys who are saying, yeah, you're going to be king, man. You can do this. You got this, buddy. We got your back. And they hear some rejoicing and celebrating and trumpets and cheering. And and they go, what does that sound? And all of a sudden a messenger comes in and goes, hey, sorry to interrupt your feast over here, but I want you to know Solomon has been crowned king. David has chosen him to be king. Everybody's celebrating. There's a great festival. He's been anointed. Now he's sitting on the throne, and everyone loves it because Solomon is king. And, uh, and this leads now to the next point, the submission. You ever have a, an awkward meal, right? It's so awkward when you're at a meal. Like you sit down, and some, somebody drops some sort of bomb, and you're like, you got food in your mouth, and it's like just kind of sitting in there. You're like looking around the room. I imagine this is what would happen in the beginning of this thing. Uh, they're all there to celebrate. Hey, Adonijah, you got this, buddy. You're going to be king. And then somebody comes in and goes, hey, Solomon is the new king. And they're like, uh, looking around. And then pretty soon they go, we better get out of here. And so they take off. Everybody leaves. Adonijah's freaking out. So he runs over to the altar, and he grabs onto the horns. And, and there's a superstitious thought that if you can hold onto the horns of the altar, that maybe nobody can attack you because you're touching such a, a godly vessel. And so Adonijah goes. He's clinging to the altar. He's hoping nobody does anything. And notice what it says in verse 53. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. And he came and paid homage to King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, Go to your house. So for a brief moment here in our passage, it seems like Adonijah is finally now having to submit to the authority of someone else, to submit to the authority of the king. It says he paid homage to Solomon. But in all reality, if you keep reading this story, it doesn't last very long. I'll just summarize for you real quickly. In the next chapter, we see there's a section in in chapter 2 where he tries to seize power once again. What he does, he has this plan. In verse 17 of chapter 2, he ends up Uh, going before Bathsheba, and he says, hey, I have one request. Please don't deny me this request. I want to take for myself a wife. I want Abishag, that lady who they found to hang out with my dad to keep him warm. I want that lady to be my wife. 
Well, what's wrong with that picture? Well, just like Absalom did in the story before, he's trying to get power. The lady who's laying next to his dad, if he gets her and marries her, everybody will think now there's some sort of authority in his life. And so this is a, a, a power play. He's trying to grab power for himself. And Solomon, who's smart enough to know and be able to read between the lines, he realizes this. And so immediately Adonijah is put to death. He's killed. And so in the end, we see Adonijah's downfall was the fact that he was unwilling to submit. Unwilling to submit to the authority of somebody else. He did not want to yield authority to the king. He wanted to be king. He, he wanted to be king. He demonstrated a king me kind of mindset. That was his heart. That was his attitude. And, and, and in so many ways, I can relate. I don't like to submit to authority. I like the idea of being in control and having power, and I'm willing to, to bet that you're probably the same way. You don't always love authority in your life. Many of us struggle with this king me kind of mindset. We don't want to submit. We don't want to listen to the king. We want to be the king. We want to be the authority. King me. This is our attitude so often. Beloved, I want to encourage you to reconsider this mindset this morning. That's what we're going to focus on because the truth is it doesn't really work out well when you have a king me kind of mindset that that mindset's been around for a really long time in fact before the foundations of the earth were laid there was someone who had the king me kind of mindset and it didn't work out well for them now we know that Adonijah he specifically used these words I will be king I will be king. And this sounds an awful lot like somebody else. If you read in, in Isaiah chapter 14, there's a description of Lucifer before he fell from heaven. And he was in God's presence and he made a series of statements. Notice what it says in Isaiah. I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. In other words, he says, king me. King me. Beloved, it didn't work out well, well for him. If that's our mindset as well, it will never work out well for us. We don't get to be the ultimate authority. We don't get to be the ultimate authority in our life. In fact, if you're a believer and you have now placed your faith in Jesus, you are now saying, I've been bought with a price. I now belong to someone else. Don't you know you're not your own? That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6. You're not your own anymore. You belong to somebody else. You're no longer the authority over your life. God has authority over your life. The only one who has authority over all heaven and all earth is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he demands our allegiance and our submission. He is the true king, not us. And so the big idea this morning is this. Submit to the king. It's pretty basic. Submit to the king. Don't walk around life seeking to crown yourself because we don't get to be king. We don't get to have the king me kind of mindset that we saw in the life of Adonijah. Jesus is the one who's been granted all authority on heaven and earth. He's the only one who reigns on high, and we're called to submit to him. And so I'm going to do something a little different this morning. What we're going to do is we're going to do a song in just a second, and I'm going to come back up, and I want to give you two practical ways that we can submit to the king. Because uh, what I want to kind of illustrate for you is that if God is the king of all the earth, and we are to submit to him, then where has God placed his authority on earth? And I want to I advocate for two specific places that are really important for us this morning, that God has placed his authority on earth. And so there are others, but these are the two biggies, okay? So two of them I'm going to talk about when I come back up. So at this time, I'll pray. Worship team can come up and, and, and we'll worship, and then we'll close that way. Let's pray. Father, just thank you. Thank you for this reminder from your word about the fact that you and you alone are king. The Father, as we look to your word, we recognize that there's so much within us that desires 
to be the authority, to, to rebel against that which you've established in our life, to, to never submit to other people or other things or to submit, never submit to you. But, Father, you have called us to submit. We are your subjects. We are your people that you have purchased by the blood of your son, Jesus. And therefore, we, we belong to you. And, Father, we are to submit to you. And I pray that through the power of your spirit, you'd help us this morning in submission. I pray that as I come back up here and begin to lay out these two specific ways that we can submit and, and the one which is maybe more controversial in our culture, I just pray that, Father, that you would just uh, soften hearts, that you'd open eyes, that you'd reveal truth, that, Father, that um, the words that I say that may not be the most popular, Father, would would still fall upon ears that can hear because, Father, it doesn't matter what's popular. It matters what's true. And I pray that we would be faithful to what's true at this church and speak the truth in love. And, I, and Father, I pray that those who belong to this church would embrace that reality, Father, because they, they know it's of you and it's not something that we're trying to do that's popular. So I just pray for that this morning. I pray that uh, this time in worship now, we would just be so reminded, Father, of the need to submit, uh, that we would be yours today. So we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.